Good morning, everyone. As Maggie mentioned, I'm Jennifer Lozeski. My daytime job is with the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology, but I really started on my naturalist journey with bees, um, specifically bumblebees and hunting for the rusty patch bumblebee in southeast Wisconsin after some training from the UW Arboretum. Um, that led me into, because I'm also a master gardener, uh, creating a pollinator group within our Southeast Wisconsin Master Gardener Group, which we learned a lot about bees and had no idea how ignorant we were until we started to, to work on them and teach each other. Um, and so I've worked probably now about eight, nine years uh, with native bees and native plants and how they interact. So we're going to talk about those fantastic bees and where to find them. So you've got a couple of examples here. We'll run through a couple different types of native bees, but we've got longhorn bees, bumblebees, leafcutter bees, um, and another bumblebee um, to start with here. So most people are amazed at the number of native bee species that we have both in the state, which is four to 500. They kind of keep finding new ones all the time. Um, some species can't be identified except to capture and put them under a microscope. Um, some are also very close in terms of looks and things like that and can't necessarily be separated by photographs. Uh, and there's lots of things, as we know, that go on in the North Woods that, you know, not everybody finds every single thing that's in there. Uh, but within North America, there are about 4,000 bee species. So bees are one of those rarities that are actually have more species diversity in dry areas. And the deserts in the southwestern U.S. have an enormous number of different types of bees. Um in Wisconsin, and in we have 20 species that technically can be found all over the state, uh, but we have about 14 that we see pretty regularly in southern Wisconsin, and that does include the bee pictured here, the federally endangered rusty patch, which we'll, we'll take a couple minutes to talk about along the way. So... Uh, not everybody understands honeybees are not native. They came with the colonists, uh, so they may go back hundreds of years, but they're technically not original to North America, although they are original to a great part of the rest of the world. Um, most native bees are solitary nesters. Uh, so that means you just have an individual female bee who mates and then creates their own nest, lays their eggs, provisions those eggs all on their own. So there's not a hive or a colony or something that they're really trying to protect the same way that you see with honeybees. Um, bumblebees do develop annual colonies. They're new each year. So they do have what's called worker bees, but the, by far the majority of the other bees are just solitary nesters. About three quarter of those are ground nesting. It seems like cavity nesters like mason bees and leafcutter bees get a lot of the publicity, uh, but by far most of the bees are ground nesters. And solitary bees rarely sting. Their mission in life for those females is to provide for the next generation. They have no interest in trying to sting anybody unless you're right on top of them. I don't think I've ever been stung by any of the solitary bees. Occasionally a bumblebee, but that's usually when I've managed to step on them or sit on them or something that is truly threatening to them. Um, and in fact, most bees can't sting. Uh, female bees can sting, but males can't. So I've got the cute little female carpenter bee here on the left. Um, she's looking kind of harmless, but she's the one that can sting, as opposed to those males that buzz you. It sounds like a train's coming in. They tend to hover around and protect an area where females are nesting. They actually have no stinger, and it's a complete bluff. Uh, so you have to understand a little bit, and for you know everybody who's afraid of bees, explaining you know some of that can really help also. 
So they have, as I mentioned, those two different nesting behaviors. Um, about a quarter of the bees are uh, uh, solitary bees or so are cavity nesters. Um, and we'll see which families that includes. It's usually the ones that have pollen in their abdomen plus a few other ones. Um, and then there's uh, the majority of the bees are mining or digging bees. So right now, mid-April is usually the time that first batch of mining bees come out. So you might see little fuzzy bees going in and out of holes in the ground like here. Uh, the, those are generally the, the early round of the mining or digging bees, uh, but you'll see them all summer long. Um, they prefer generally sandy loose soil and they don't like mulch or anything that's covering things. Um, typically, if you also find an area where they are, it's great to lessen the amount of digging that you do in there. Um, I've had one area along the south side of my house where I used to have a lot of them, but I can't help myself. I end up, you know, putting in a vine or, you know, planting something. And they also do tend to cycle out of an area after a point. Um, they kind of often are in little groups, but it's things that look like little anthills. But you'll see a single bee going in and out. If you see many bees coming in and out of the same hole, it's more likely to be yellow jackets, which are the only wasp species that nests in the ground. Just a real basic, you know, I know we've got a lot of longtime naturalists, so you may not need, you know, too much explanation here. Um, but bees and wasps are very similar. Uh, there's kind of some thought that wasps developed or bees developed from wasps as alternate feeders on nectar and pollen. So they develop these hairs that help them carry that. They basically, they bring it in to provision for the eggs that they lay. Um, flies often look more like bees and sometimes it really takes having a photo before you recognize, oh yeah, that's a hoverfly, not a, not a bee. Um, but they have larger eyes, short antenna, and tend to, some are hairy like tachinid flies, um, but those look less like bees. Um, most of the time when they look like bees, there's something within the, the flower fly or serpent fly family. And then there's those glorious uh, hummingbird moths with the clear wings. And as I call it, the shrimp tail, uh, that's usually the biggest giveaway if you're seeing them from far away and you're just seeing this fuzzy body with yellow and black, you may not realize right away that it's a moth and not a bee. But as you look at it, you know, you can see the differences a little more obviously. In, in, with bee, identifying native bees, there's a lot of, it's one of those things that the more you pay attention, the easier it is to start figuring out which type of bee it is. Out in the field, there's a lot of differences between how the bees look, how they behave, what type of plants they're on, you know, the same plant as here with the, the Monarda, you can see you've got the little specialist bee that's on the pollen at the very end of each individual flower. And you've got, it's one of the favorites for all bumblebees, but especially the really big bumblebees. So you've got this huge different in size. You're never gonna, you know, mistake one bee for the other. Um, on the left side on the cone flowers, you've got probably a sweat bee compared to a bumblebee size wise. On the goldenrod, you've got a green sweat bee, you know, with two different bumblebees. Um, a lot of the goldenrods have a variety of wasps and bees at the same time. So that can be a good way to, to tell some differences. And then a little bit of flea bane, uh, the smaller the flower, often the smaller the bee. Uh, there's nothing that prevents larger bees from using it. But like anything else, when you kind of have too much competition, you know, they'll start self-segregating into what makes sense for them. Um, that gives them the best chance of some good food. Um, so you can see differences in size and shapes, and we'll see that all along the way. Um, where they hold their pollen is something else we'll talk about. You can see oftentimes there's big yellow legs um, and pollen can be held in different places for different bees. And then what plants they're on, as I just started to talk about, things that have smaller flowers versus very large flowers. So with where's the pollen on the bee, we have 
one family of bees that are primarily out in spring and summer um, where they hold that pollen. And again, it's only females who have pollen or who are collecting pollen, um, not just eating it. And they've got it on the underside of their abdomen. So we'll see a couple of these examples. And then the majority by far of bees hold pollen on their legs, generally on leg hairs, but uh, we'll see some differences in, in the next slide. And the, the bees that have no pollen on them, often they have these very skinny legs like that. There are cuckoo bees that are like cuckoo birds and they just lay their eggs in the nest of other bees and take advantage of all their work that it went into provisioning that nest. Um, there's also something called yellow-faced or mask bees that uh, collect pollen in, in a very different way, or they're a male bee. Male bees just get to lollygag around and wait to mate and feed where they want, and they don't go around collecting pollen or helping with the nesting at all. So within those uh, different ways that bees collect on their legs, only honeybees and bumblebees have what we call a corbiculum or a pollen basket. So you can see kind of some extremes here where they're very, very full. The bee does a mixture of nectar and pollen that makes it stickier. And there's kind of a little indentation in their leg that gives it a little bit of support. And then you can see the long hairs that go around it to hold it in. Uh, by far, most of the solitary bees, though, have just these extra long and kind of staticky hairs on their legs that, that help keep that pollen in place so that they can carry it back to their nesting area. When you get into more kind of advanced, and we're talk, we'll talk a little bit about iNaturalist and Bug Guide and some of those resources, when you really want to figure out what you're seeing, um, with photographs, one of the best ways that the experts can figure it out is often the patterning of the veins on their wings. I know that sounds really weird, but different species will have different angles and spacing to those veins. And oftentimes, you know, if there's a line here, it means it's this species. And if it doesn't have that, then it's a different species. Um, so you really you want to try to get the best photos possible, you know, in any circumstances, but to also think when you're submitting photos about, did I catch one that has a really great wing veining pattern? So, you know, that might be the way that they can ID it um, because iNaturalist is getting close. I mean, the AI is getting really good, but there's nothing like having one of the experts come in and rather than just telling you what, you know, genus it is that they can narrow it down to exactly what it is. Cause some of them are really cool and have some really cool names, we'll see. And the where to find them part, uh, native bees, native plants for the most part, you will see bees on non-native plants and it just kind of depends on the plant and how much nectar and pollen they have. But that most reliable interaction or connection for identification um, comes from native plants where they're used to feeding. Um, and Heather Holm out of Minnesota has just really done a tremendous job for all of us in becoming so fascinated with all different types of insects. She's done a bee book and a wasp book, uh, mostly the, on the pollinating wasp. Um, so there's some really great information in there that if you know what plant you're looking at um, that she gives you kind of a smaller universe of things that it's likely to be and a lot of bees and wasps and beetles uh, so and for a lot of us that have gotten more into insects that's really where it started when she came out with that book I think it was 2016 2017 right around when I just started because even trained naturalists hadn't paid that much attention to bees um, and it was kind of this revelation of oh my gosh now if I see that big black wasp on the swamp milkweed, I can figure out, you know, that's a great black wasp. <laughs> um, so sometimes the names seem obvious, but, you know, we really want to understand what it is, read up on them more, you know, this is one of the best ways to do that. 
And the common need of these is a little field handout that you can take with you. So it's, it, you know, if you don't know anything about your bees, it's not probably the best starting point. But for those of us that are, are trying to pay a little more attention and once you start kind of figuring out what's what, um, it's a really useful guide. In a native yard, I know a lot of you have great native yards from you know our, our past conversations and your UEC uh, connections. Uh, it's really having that diversity of species flowering at the same time, because you're gonna keep hearing different bees are on different things. The more you have, the better it is for all different sorts of pollinators. Um, and, and bees primarily don't do red orange. You know, They might know that they're there, but they can't actually see red as the color red. So most of the red you see in my yard occasionally is for hummingbirds. Um, but really you're talking about softer colors when you're trying to attract bees. And in the summertime, I think we all know when you're out on a prairie, it's just full of yellow <laughs> everywhere, you know, with the occasional purple. Um, so those are really your best color combinations if you're looking to, to provide for and see a variety of bees. So the great thing for me is this is all right out my back door. Uh, so even when I'm busy and I'm not getting out as much to natural areas, I can go outside for 10 or 15 minutes and just find the most amazing things once you start paying attention. So the types of flowers that, that bees like, um, all types of bees will generally go on things that are kind of daisy style and flat where the nectar and the pollen is readily available. Uh, the smaller bees will definitely be there because that's where they're most comfortable and they have the best access. The larger flowers, typically you'll see the larger bees. Um, for Monarda, it's you know primarily bumblebees, but you'll occasionally see leaf cutters or a few other things in there. Um, but some of the smaller bees find shortcuts. Uh, carpenter bees, even though they're a large bee, don't have a long tongue like a lot of the bumblebees. So they tend to cut holes that's closer to the nectar and shortcut to what to do what we call nectar robbing. And then you'll often see honeybees and other smaller bees coming through. Um, that's actually one of the best behaviors to try to identify rusty patch bumblebees when nearly all the bumblebees are on bee balm or monarda. Um, the rusty patch will generally be circling around on the top because they have a little bit shorter tongue and they can't go in the side like the bees are doing here. The great thing for those of us who love having natural yards and all kinds of wildlife um, is that those early blooming, especially shrubs, and then some of the later blooming flowers also, once they're pollinated by bees, turn into great bird food and bird attractors. Um, so one of when I started with uh, pollinators and, and bees, one of the toughest things is that not a lot of yards had great spring pollinating flowers. That's part of the origin of No Mow May is that, you know, even though these are weeds, you will see bees on them because in our barren suburban landscapes, there's just nowhere else for them to find food. So actually the better tactic is to plant more native plants, especially shrubs, and that provides for those early season blooms that help provide much better nutrition for bees, especially queen bumblebees. Um, so you get the added bonus when you're providing for pollinators, you're also often providing for birds. There's um, a, actual groups of bees that often specialize in particular plants, especially with these early spring, uh, not just the ephemerals, you could see one on a geranium here, uh, but almost every spring ephemeral has a specialty bee. So when I was out last weekend um, in a natural area, you just saw swarms of these little fuzzy bees everywhere on the spring beauty. There is a specialist in spring beauty. They're not necessarily all spring beauty, but they are those early mining bees. So there's one for water leaf. Uh, there's one for uh, geraniums. There's one for, you know, just almost every spring flower that there is. So there's a really fun article. It's it's based out of the Delaware, Virginia area, 
but it gives a long list of what all the specialist bees that were found in that area to give you some idea of what we're talking about. And, you know, Doug Tallamy and Heather Holm are both trying to talk a lot about we really need to provide these specialty plants because these bees can't live without them. The generalist bees, you know, a lot of bumblebees and leafcutter bees, they're not as particular about what they feed on. But for these bees, we won't have these bees if you don't have the plants that they feed on. So to really make an effort, if you're interested in planning for pollinators, to put the specialty bee flowers in. So we're going to talk first a little bit about spring. We're kind of walking through the seasons and, and talking bees and plants along the way. Um, and in spring, as I mentioned, we're seeing those mining bees are usually one of the first ones out. Um, those spring ephemeral specialists, because that's when their flowers are there. And we're going to talk a little bit about queen bumblebees and their annual cycle. Um, and I mentioned here cellophane bees, uh, but we're actually not going to talk too many specifics on them. Uh, but a lot of the things that are in that, um, basically the, the pollen on the abdomen family, there's a fair number that are out early and other species that continue into summer. So for the bumblebee queens, they are just emerging right now. Usually mid-April is when they start coming out and different species have different emergence times. So we usually see the two spotted right away. That's what you'll often see on bluebells like here. Um, and then there's the uh, common eastern and a few that are out early. Then you'll start to see the rest kind of coming along. So by the time you hit some of the Baptisia or false blue indigo, you see more of the brown belted and the um, red belted and <clears throat> some of the later emergers. So they're really fascinating to watch. Almost everything you see at this time of year is, is a queen. The, the first generation of workers don't emerge typically till the second or third week in June. Um, and they'll be much, much smaller. So this is a really fun time to be out there, but it, it's very hard to catch them. <laughs> They're also looking for a place to nest. So most of the time you see them in your yard or out in the woodlands, you know, they're moving so fast. They're investigating holes. They're looking for those old chipmunk dens to start their, their nesting area. Um, so you may have to get video to try to catch them at this time of year and see what they might be. Um, but as I said, basically everything is a queen right now. So they have started, um, they, they are already mated and come out in spring. So they're looking for those places to nest. Then they do the first brood all themselves. Um, so they gather all the provisions. They stay in the nest uh, to try to keep things warm. Be bumblebees can actually self-regulate their temperature. So they shiver their wings to increase the temperature. Um, so they make sure that their young can develop as quickly as possible. And then, as I mentioned, about mid-June, the workers start taking over. And then later in the summer, again, at different times for different species of bumblebees, they, the uh, colonies start producing new queens and then also the males. So they come out late summer, early fall, mate. And then as soon as she's got a good amount of food and provisions to get her through the winter, the new queens go underground. So they're usually not that far, like less than six inches. We don't know a lot about how they choose where they go. I've had some go in container plants that happen to be in the garage. Uh, I, I store a few things over winter. Um, they could be out and under your leaves, which is another reason to leave the leaves. Um, but they basically, some will go in as early as August, which doesn't seem like it should work when it's super hot out, but they do. Um, and then they're underground and kind of have an antifreeze in their, their system that allows them to get through the winter and then they come out in spring. So as I mentioned, mining bees are one of the first things out. So that lower right is the first thing I usually see, these little teeny tiny fuzzy bees coming out. 
Um, that upper right is a mining bee that I saw on the cherry trees a few years ago, right by the bridge in the in Washington Park, uh, when where we'd start when we used to do the birding there. Um, so there's a series, any place you see those spring blooming trees, you should take a good look. Uh, there's probably some mining bees in there. Um, so they do have some different appearances, but typically they'll have that shiny abdomen um, with different different combinations of things. And they, they are pollen on legs, as you can see clearly from the one on the bottom. Um, so they have those long scope of hairs and carry things back to their nesting area that way. Mason bees were a really big thing when I started. They were going to be the answer to all of the honeybees dying off that because they basically within that tube that they're working there and they're called mason bees because they usually seal with mud um, and that they produce hard cocoons that you can refrigerate and transport around. And, you know, there was going to be a whole industry, it seemed, built on that. Um, but they really are truly kind of orchard bees. And you usually don't find, I don't think I've ever seen one in my yard. Um, so even if you put up those bee houses and things, you're not usually typically going to see mason bees using them. There needs to be more kind of a, I think a large mass of trees that they might use to see them around as much. It's not that you'll never see them in an urban area. It's just a little bit of an urban myth that these are the bees we should be protecting and they're everywhere. Um, so they are really interesting though, and they are much more efficient pollinators than, than honeybees. Um, so they definitely do have great uses um, and, and the possibility of using them in agriculture. Moving on to summer. Summer is high bee time. And that's when you start to hear that hum in the air and see a lot more bees, a lot different sizes on a lot more things. So there's really a plethora of bees that are out in this time. So we're kind of going to work our way through a little bit to see, um, you know, once you start kind of paying attention, there really are some differences and hopefully, because what I found over time is that at least you can say, okay, well, it's one of these two or three things. Um, and there is a project called WeBe that's done out of the uh, UWB lab that um, allows us to do like 15 minute stretches to identify bees. And even they get it that sometimes it's just small black bee or small brown bee. Uh, you know, you can't always tell specific species, even with a little bit of training. Um, but you can at least get it in the ballpark. And some are easier than others. So here we go. The big bee. Uh, this, as I mentioned, this is a federally endangered bee. It is the rarest bee. Um, we just happen to be very fortunate that in Wisconsin, it is more prevalent than almost anywhere else. Minnesota and Illinois have good bunches of it. Um, but once we started looking, we are finding it consistently through at least that southern ecological zone in Wisconsin that runs beneath that ecological tension zone, but occasionally up north also. Um, so I am fortunate enough to have it in my yard. I'm in an area of Wauwatosa where it's fairly plentiful. You know, you don't typically see it, though, until you hit midsummer. Uh, where the volume of the colonies is up a little bit and you're more likely to see the males out and about also. So as you can see here, that big yellow bloom is St. John's wort. That is one of their absolute favorites at the height of summer. So if you want to learn and learn to recognize bumblebees, that is one of the best plants because you'll see several species of bumblebees at the same time and they move pretty fast but sometimes it's easier to sort things out than on the uh, Monarda where almost all the species also come uh, kind of around the same time. So one of the best places you can go is at Washington Park where you've got these huge St. John's wort bushes by the uh, you know amphitheater area. And then close to that, you've also got the rain garden. Um, and that has typically, well, I guess the Monarda is more on the prairie, but they're not too far apart. So those are two prime spots to really kind of help you sort through your bumblebees. 
We have yet to find the rusty patch. Uh, keep looking at Washington and Menominee Valley. It sure seems like it should be there because there are other areas across the river and maybe a little bit west uh, where it can be found. Um, so we keep looking, uh, but we have found it at Riverside. Uh, the first time I found it there, it was a one shot experience. I got my one photo and it had that rusty patch. So that was the first time we had found one there. Uh, and Ethan and I were lucky enough to see another one there, but I haven't gotten to Riverside quite as much to see how they're doing there. If you want to work on bumblebees and it's it's really fun and it's just based on photographed, uh, photographs, the DNR has a great program. They have training on the website, whether you participate on the program or not, you can learn a lot about different bees species and how to identify them. Um, and they do a really good job, except during the very, very height of the season of keeping up with identifications. So you just take your best guess at what you think it is, but there are people who will come through and do that identification for you and explain why it's that type of bee. So it's really a great way to learn, to, to work with some of your photos, try to figure out what you think it is, but then you also have that backup of the experts telling you what it actually is and why. Uh, so it's really a great program if you have some time to participate. Just for fun, I threw in a few of the, the bumblebee lookalikes to talk about. We already talked about the clear wing uh, moths, uh, but we've got a couple of other things here uh, that people often mistake for bumblebees. So one that has been really fun uh, to see and work with is digger bees. Um, you can see they're a little bit rounder than bumblebees and they also have, if they're female, that pollen visible on their like hairs instead of tucked into that pollen basket. Uh, they often have colonies together and on one of our walks a couple of years ago, we ran into this odd bunch of holes in the Menominee Valley uh, section where you know we saw things going in and out and i and i kind of knew what it was but i think probably the uec intern got better pictures <laughs> than i did but this was kind of a double win because not only did i finally get it identified but it was also john asher who's like the premier uh b identifier on iNaturalist is the person who confirmed exactly which species it was. Uh, so that, that was a really fun experience and a bunch of people got an opportunity to see it. Um, I've also seen them in the rain garden at uh, Washington Park. So it's one of those things that you originally, you usually think it's a bumblebee, um, but the combination of things and it's usually slightly smaller than that. Uh, there's another species that I just think that name is pretty fun, the orange-tipped wood digger. Um, there are some that do nest in wood, and it's sometimes it's really hard. I have here kind of whether they're a ground nester or a cavity nester, but sometimes within the same family or genus, they might do different things. So, so you know, most of them might be ground nesters, and then occasionally one's a wood nester. Um, so it, it's very interesting that there isn't a set pattern with a lot of the native bees. And for anybody who's out and about, you've probably seen robber flies. I just think they're so much fun to photograph. They are just so funky and weird looking. Uh, these are some that I actually found during the bio blitz when we were out a couple of years ago. That's another really fun thing to do if you like to learn about nature. Um, since two years ago, they're including taking photos and submitting them to iNaturalist for ID. So for those of us who aren't professionals or who may not have, you know, extreme identification skills for some of these insects, it's really a fun experience to photograph what you see and, and see what the answers are, you know, the same way you would on iNaturalist, but they have people actually working during that day to identify things from photos too. And then the, the most commonly confused thing for the average person is carpenter bees. Um, they come out usually towards the end of spring. Uh, they might be starting to come out already, 
but I really think of them as high summer bees because that's where you have more numbers. As I mentioned, you've got the males kind of hovering around to protect areas where, where the females are nesting. And the giant carpenter bee is the only bee here that actually can chew into wood. Um, so it doesn't seem to matter whether it's, you know, varnish painted, shellac protected, whatever, they'll still find what they like. And they don't really cause too much damage. They're not like carpenter ants. They don't take a structure down just because of the sheer volume of their eating. The downside is that sometimes the woodpeckers will find them and take out a whole strip of wood to get at the grubs that are in there that are probably pretty big and tasty. So, um, they can cause some damage that way, um, but on their own, they're really pretty harmless. So, um, and typically they prefer Monarda and some of the bigger flowers in your garden. Um, and they will do, as I said, that nectar robbing. Uh, so you can see that little female doing, doing that on one of my Monardas. Um, so you can see too, even though they look like bumblebees and particularly a pattern for one bumblebee, usually the uh, brown, uh, brown belted that you, you see in the upper left of the bumblebees that has that one spot and kind of a, uh, you know, the abdomen will look very similar, um, but they have one or two segments on their abdomen, or sorry, the thorax looks similar. Um, one or two stripes on their abdomen where you can tell the difference. The carpenter bees may have that top one, um, but that's the wrong mix for bumblebees. It's the Eastern common who has only that first segment of the abdomen that's yellow fuzzy. Um, so, but they don't have that, that same look to them. So it's one of those things that it's, it's a very close mimic, uh, but they're not the same. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's a small carpenter bee. That's one of the absolute smallest bees that you'll see. Um, on that lower right, it's on a tropical milkweed. Maybe that gives you a sense of how small it is, or the middle one's on a coreopsis, and the one on the left is on a flea vein. Um, so they're very, very small and generally kind of that shiny metallic uh, and you don't see that much hair on them, although you do see a little pollen on the leg of the one on the flea bane. Um, so they are cavity nesters also, but rather than chewing through wood, which they can't do, they go into plant pith and kind of chew and push that pith out of the way in a plant stem to build their nest. So they have to have some kind of opening to start with. So typically there are things that are broken or torn uh, where they can start getting in. Leaf cutter bees are one of the funnest things to watch and they have all kinds of really cool names and looks to them. Um, so typically they're the bee that you'd see the most besides bumblebees on things like swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed. They really do have a milkweed preference. You can see they have the long hairs on their abdomen. Um, so they're different than many of the bees that you're seeing at this time of year. They come in small sizes and large sizes. Once you start looking around on your plants, I think you'll be amazed at the, the variety that you'll see. Uh, because they chew those leaves, they have very large mouth parts um, to do that. And this is one of the funnest bees that I've ever had identified, again, by John Asher um, in the, the habitat garden that we have at the zoo in the family farm. Occasionally, aside from working in the garden, I take a few photos and we found something called the broad handed leaf cutter bee named for those really long hairs that it has instead of on its back leg, which is where you usually see those in that circled area, you can see it's on its front leg. So hence the name broad handed. Uh, but I also love the petal cutter. Uh, so there's a lot of, of fun things found in this family. And just to give you some idea, it's amazing how fast they cut those holes. So if you have roses, or I just saw a ton of activity last year on the um, gray um, dogwood that we have at that zoo garden, they just go boom, boom, boom to cut through that leaf. Um, and then they carry it and they are cavity nesters. 
So it takes them multiple trips to line just one egg cell. Um, typically with cavity nesting bees, as you saw in the earlier photo, they do one little cell and then they wall it off from the next one and one little cell and they wall it off. And for leaf cutter bees, they do all that with leaves. So they line all the way around the cell and then between the cells, and then they have to create that nectar and pollen bee bread to lay an egg on. So it's no wonder they're pretty tired and they're protecting their nests. So usually they're sleeping in whatever cavity they're working on. And those are about only half an inch long so, you know, you it, within a six inch stretch of stem, you may have 12 or more, um, you know, cells provisioned and they only do 20 to 30 eggs in their lifetime. Um, so they're alive for a couple of weeks. They come, that species comes out usually around the same time each year. Um, and that's their lifetime. Carter bees are again, another bee where they have pollen on their abdomen. Most of the ones that we see are actually not native. I don't know that I've ever photographed a native Carter bee uh, because both of the ones that, that I've seen in, you know, in my yard and other areas are non-natives that have kind of taken over. So the one that most people see and you're most familiar with is that super aggressive European Carter bee male. As aggressive as, you know, Carpenter bees can be sometimes a European carter bee is like a fifth of the size and it will take on those carpenter bees to keep them away from plants that its females like to use. So for its mating opportunities, it protects things where females might be gathering uh, either nectar and pollen or especially the things that they line their uh, nesting cells with. So in this case, it's on lamb's ear, which is very, very common. Almost anywhere you have lamb's ear, you'll see carter bees around. Um, I have them also on some of my annual salvias that are seem to be particularly nectar and pollen rich. Um, so they're usually circling through, making sure everybody else stays away. Um, those oblong carter, wool carter bees on the bottom are on my alliums. Um, so again, smaller bees, generally smaller flowers. And also related in that family is resin bees. Um, instead of lining things with leaves or plant fibers, they line it with their own secretions. So they mix kind of thing, uh, their saliva with some things that, that come out of their body to line their nests and make them basically waterproof and bacteria proof. Um, so or in this case, um, actually, sorry, that's the cellophane bees um, who are another close relative and the resin bees use plant resin the same way. So they work with something that's more liquid. Um, so they're a little harder to tell from the others, but again, you can see how small these are. This is on blue vervain, um, and it's probably a pearly everlasting, but I can't remember exactly what plant that is on the left. So masked bees are as small or smaller than those little carpenter bees. So they're primarily on really small flowers and you just see these little black things buzzing around. It's only when you take photos that you see these beautiful patterns on their body. Um, the face shots, you can see they have like a little yellow triangle there. Um, there's also uh, other mass bees that have other patterns with more yellow. Um, so they're really fun to catch and see what's going on. Um, that they'll be on almost all of my herbs and you know anything where there's kind of large groups of small flowers. And when they, you can see they have almost no hair on them. Um, so the way that they collect that nectar and pollen is they actually ingest it and hold it in a crop in their throat and then regurgitate it in their nest and spread it around. Um, so it's a little different strategy. Um, so again, those are one of the ones that you don't see the pollen on the outside, even if it's a female. And then we're getting towards the end here, but this is another one of my favorites. To me, these are just the cutest bees and I'm not normally one to go cute as everybody knows, um, but they really are extraordinary. The males have these super long antennae. That's why they're known as the longhorn bees. 
there's a couple different families of them. Uh, so they have a couple different names. And but the females have very short antenna and often are just super pollen heavy with that bright orange or, or bright yellow uh, pollen on their legs. They really most of the, the, the species do prefer sunflowers. So anything Coreopsis, um, Heliopsis, actual sunflowers, um, Rebecca, you'll see them on all kinds of, of plants like that. Um, and we act, I actually caught some mating on a sunflower one year. Um, so you can also see some of the males have super cool eyes. They're like this cloudy green um, that's really striking. But then there's a few that like other flowers um, and the two spotted looks completely different. Uh, there's also a variation that shows up on thistle later in the summer. That's also all black that's in this family. Um, so they, the two spotted is one of the bees that probably people ask me about most. You know, they start describing something that's black with white on its butt and I have to, you know, decide, you know, get ask a few more questions to figure out if they're talking about a bald faced hornet, uh, which has that pattern, or the completely harmless uh, two spotted longhorn bee. So they usually pop up in the middle of the summer and then all of a sudden they're everywhere. Uh, so that's one of the ones that, that people really want to know what it is. So next time you'll know. And the last batch or almost last batch, the sweat bees, they are generally very small. Um, you can see by some of the, the plants they're on, um, on the cone flower, you know, they're not taking up any big part of it. Um, sometimes you can catch them kind of sitting on leaves and, and grooming. Um, but they're not quite as small as the carpenter bees. You know, they're, they're kind of like about a fingernail size um, in length. So, and they also have a couple different styles of bodies, but anything that's green and metallic is basically a sweat bee. So the, the one in the middle on that bottom gets a little more towards the blue green. And sometimes those can be wasps. Um, but for the most part, when you're talking about a true green, uh, whether it's bicolored with different stripes on the abdomen or straight metallic, there's two different families there. Um, those are, are pretty much sweat bees. So then they're all kind of around the same size. So once you see the green ones, you can start to, to figure out some of the brown or black stripe ones that might also be sweat bees. Uh, but there is some overlap between some of those longhorn bees and the sweat bees in terms of size and, and what they look like. So that's why some, you know, some of those are a tougher call. Um, but generally, you'll see them on those real small flowers. Mountain mint is one of their absolute favorites. Mountain mint, for me, is almost always a mix between red belted bumblebees, which kind of go their own way on a lot of the flowers that they're on versus the bigger bumblebees. And um, some of the wasps, there are some that particularly like, like mountain mint also, but you've usually got an interesting community of like seven or eight insects pretty consistently on, on mountain mint. So it, and it is also a rusty patch favorite, by the way, I don't usually see them on that in my yard, but in some of the natural areas, um, like over at Schlitz Audubon, they have a prairie that is full of mountain mint and culver's root at the same time. And you'll see them on both of them, you know, together in that area. And that very end of the summer, there's not really any new bees, but the mining bees come back around. They're generally spring or fall. You have the males come out for bumblebees, as I've mentioned, and the new queens. The carpenter bees are very long lived, unlike a lot of the other bees that only live a couple of weeks. Most of those carpenter bee females, especially, will survive most of the summer. It takes them a really long time to dig those tunnels into wood and get that next generation set up. In fact, they take so long that sometimes the first of their daughters start to emerge <laughs> before they're finished laying all their eggs. Um, so you mostly see just a little bit different mix of a lot of the same species. And then just to finish up, uh, those cuckoo bees can be really fun, even if they're, you know, they're still part of nature, even if they're not doing all their own nurturing. Um, you 
the the nomad bees were just fascinating they were actually a relatively they were in june at one of the bio blitzes where i found them the first time and they just have that beautiful copper glint to them um that is just very unusual and those super long antenna uh so they can be a really fun one to to figure out and sort through and get identified so my final message Get out there and explore this summer. Um, there's so many fun things to see. Bees are just part of it. Um, you find these little bracketed wasps uh, where they're, this one, the ovipositor is out. That is not a stinger. It's trying to get at a caterpillar in the middle of that heliopsis. So we've got a locust borer beetle, one of the most beautiful widow skimmers I've ever seen that just had this incredibly vibrant color to it in my own yard. Um, and one of the coolest UEC finds I've ever had at Riverside, there was a pair of mating gold mark thread masted wasps on some of the Indian plantain. You've got a little emerald, now I'll forget what it is, but the caterpillar that takes all the petal parts. When I was out for the backyard naturalist, that was one of the funnest discoveries in my yard. And then, you know, even if it's a flower eating beetle, it just, you know, a really cool beetle. So a lot of these were from my yard. And so, as I said, it's great to just take a few minutes, walk around your yard, see what you can find. Thanks so much for your time and attention. I really, really appreciate it. And I know most of you and any of you are, can feel free to contact me. You know, if you ever have any questions or want to invite me to do something, hopefully I can find the time. Oh, that would be fun.